The scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor clothe them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we most chiefly so to do when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying, After me. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have heard and strayed by thy ways like a lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have let our love of those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no doubt in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises, declared unto mankind, in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce for his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, Thou our lips, and our mouths shall show forth thy grace. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, o Lord make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. Lord of our shepherd. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Psalm 37. Fret not thyself because of the ungodly, neither be thou envious against the evildoers. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass, and be withered and driven Put thou thy trust in the Lord, and be doing good. Dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight out thou in the Lord. And you shall give thee thy heart's desire. Commit thy way unto the Lord, and put thy trust in him, and he shall bring it to pass. You shall be on that thy righteousness to the day of thy life, and thy desire to be as the noonday. Hold thee still in the Lord, and abide patiently upon. 
upon him. But grieve not thyself at him whose way doth prosper against the man that doeth after evil counsels. Leave him off and off, and let him go to death. Let him not tell us that thou shalt thy be moved to evil. Wicked doers shall be rooted out, and they that patiently abide the Lord, those shall inherit the land. But the meek spirited shall possess the earth and shall be refreshed in the multitude of peace. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now. Here beginneth the second chapter of the book of Job. Again, it was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him a pot's herd to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him, they came every one from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildai the Shuite, and Zophar the Naamathite. For they had made an appointment together to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they lifted up their eyes afar off and knew him not, they lifted up their voice and wept, and they rent every one his mantle and sprinkled dust upon their heads toward heaven. So they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights, and none spake a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great. Here endeth the first lesson. invite you to stand for the magnificent. <laughs> my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour, for he hath regarded the loneliness of his family. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, for he that is mighty hath magnified me. And for the Lord is the same. And his mercy is on them that fear him throughout all the generations. He has shed the strength of his arm. He has scattered the power of the imagination of their hearts. 
Here beginneth the 18th verse of the first chapter of Matthew. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had <coughs> brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Here ends. I invite you to stand as we say together the night for us. Lord, now let us thou thy servants depart in peace according to thy word. For my eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, to be a light to lighten the Gentiles, and to be glory. Lord, have 
have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Grant us our salvation. O Lord, save the Queen. And let us be blessed when we call upon thee. And do thy ministers with righteousness. And make thy chosen people be O Lord, save thy people. And let us be righteous. Give peace in our time, O Lord. Because there is none other that fighteth for us but only thou, O God. O God, make clean our hearts within us. And take not thy good spirit from us. O God, the strength of all them that put their trust in thee, mercifully accept our prayers. And because through the weakness of our mortal nature we can do no good thing without thee, grant us the help of thy grace, that in keeping of thy commandments we may please thee, both in will and deed. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee, we being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness, through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy, defend us from all perils and dangers of this night, for the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, who hast created us for thy glory and service, give us grace, we pray thee, to hallow every gift and improve each talent thou hast committed to us, that with a cheerful and diligent spirit we may render thee our grateful service, and whatsoever we do, may do it with all our might, in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who has taught us by love to serve one another. Give us eyes of compassion for human suffering and need, wherever it is found, and especially for that which lies nearest to our own doors. Save us from neglecting life's opportunities, and grant that while we have time, we may do good to all men, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. In a moment of silence, we bring before the Lord our own prayers and petitions. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and dost promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, 
granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today, our first reading takes us straight to the heart of one of the most difficult questions that I'm asked. Mostly, the question comes from school children, and if you ever want to test your theology, speak to a class of year six children. Sometimes, the question comes from people who want to challenge the belief in God, and it's simple. Why does God allow suffering? The book of Job presents us with this character, Job, who is described as a righteous man, a man of integrity. Therefore, from the very beginning of the book, he is firmly established as blameless and undeserving of all that then happens to him. He loses his wealth, his cattle, his property, his family are taken away from him and he becomes severely ill. It's worth mentioning that in the Gospel of Matthew, we also have suffering. Joseph, too, is an upright man. He's just. Yet he finds himself faced with a situation where he, no doubt, initially felt very betrayed by Mary. It is only through the intervention of the Lord in a dream that he is given assurances that that is not the case. And then, by remaining faithful and steadfast by Mary's side, he would then face a future threatened by a tyrant and would need to flee to Egypt as a refugee. How is it fair that this suffering is the outcome for a man who is obedient and righteous? And this is the question that Job faces as he sits on a rubbish heap, scraping at his sores. His wife calls on him to curse God and die. But Job wants something more than mere release from suffering. Just like the year six children with their bold questions, what Job wants is answers. And much of the book of Job is taken up with discussions between Job and his three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. They are good friends. They have heard of Job's plight and have traveled to be with him. And initially, they simply sit with him. But later on in the book, they debate with him. They try to find a cause for Job's situation, because if you can find the cause, maybe you can have the solution. So what they tell him is this, all suffering is caused by sin. Now this was a fairly traditional view. If we jump to the ninth chapter of the Gospel of St. John, when the disciples see a man who was born blind since birth, they ask Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So to Job's friends, therefore, the solution was simple. Job is suffering, therefore Job must have sinned. So they tell him, repent, admit your faults, and hope that God will then have mercy on you and put everything right. Job rejects this. He tells them, he has not sinned, and he won't repent of something that he hasn't done. And so if Job is suffering, it becomes clear that suffering cannot be the result of sin. Here's the truth. Suffering is not God's punishment for sin. Now there are definitely things in the world that happen because there is cause and effect. So one example, the tsunami of 2004 caused greater death and damage because 
mangrove forests had been cut down for development. It was only afterwards that we realised that mangroves actually save lives when tsunamis hit because they reduce wave damage, as well as, of course, increasing biodiversity and all the other good things about them. However, the tsunami wasn't sent to punish the people. So why does Job suffer? We don't know. The truth is the question of suffering remains, and at heart it remains a mystery. Perhaps it was because it resulted in good. Out of Job's suffering, he has a deep personal encounter with God, and it created a piece of literature which has lasted for thousands of years and has helped and sustained those who are suffering. And we can see this in Jesus' response to the disciples who asked about the man born blind. Jesus said, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, for this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Perhaps Job's suffering proved the truth. Satan had accused Job and of all people of only following God in the good times. Job's example shows that God is there for us in the bad times as well. Job's faith survived a test of fire, but to do so, it had to go through the flames. All suffering is a test. The message of Job is that suffering will happen, and often there will be no discernible reason, and this means good people will suffer. We can shout and argue with God about this. We can scream, it isn't fair, up to heaven. Do this. That's honest communication with God. However, suffering does not mean that God is unjust, uncaring or powerless. Job is not ultimately about why suffering happens, but about how we should react to it. Even when our lives are full of darkness and despairing questions, remember that God still loves us, listens to us, and leads us home. I publish the bands of marriage between Peter James Gredit of the parish of All Saints Dane Hill and Catherine Louise Nash, also of the parish of All Saints Dane Hill, but with a qualifying connection to this parish. If any of you know cause or just impediment why these two persons should not be joined together in holy matrimony, Ye are to declare it. This is for the first time of asking. And I do ask that you keep Pete and Kate in your prayers as they prepare for their wedding day. In our notices, uh, I draw your attention to the fact next Sunday, uh, 9 o'clock, will be Holy Communion here from All Saints. Brook. And also, on Friday the 11th of June, the funeral of Susan Chapman will take place here. We've been praying for Susan, the repose of her soul throughout the last couple of weeks, but please do keep Peter and the family in your prayers as they prepare for this final farewell of our dear friend Susan. Church wardens, any notices? No? Thank you. Let us finish by saying together the grace. The grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ.